the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. scales. 
I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Uriah, the son of Mahasiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed, and of all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. The word of the Lord. God, 
the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To be him be honor and glory and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their faith in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves in a, as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The word of the Lord. We stand as we welcome the gospel. Christ according to Luke. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm, and those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. The rich man said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have fought five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of Christ. to my 
mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This word of God to the prophet Jeremiah is nothing short of stunning. We're told it is given in the 10th year of the reign of King Zedekiah. That's usual. Biblical prophecies are almost always, maybe even always, contextualized by giving a particular time and place in Israel. Think of Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. Or when John the Baptist is introduced, we're told that it is during Herod's reign. It is a way of saying that God's words came to real people in real places at real times. But this time, in addition to being told that this word of God came to Jeremiah in the 10th year of Zedekiah's reign, we're also given another much more unusual detail. It is also the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Nebuchadnezzar, you'll remember from the story of Daniel in the lion's den, and he is the king in Babylon. He has nothing to do with Israel. So why is he mentioned? Well, because unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar is about to have a lot to do with Israel, and not with Israel's consent. That foreign king's army, we're told, is besieging Jerusalem at the very time that God's word is being given to Jeremiah. It seems humanity hasn't changed. And so this passage opens with a description of a double imprisonment. Jeremiah is in jail, as prophets often are, but Jerusalem is in a kind of prison too, because to be besieged is to be surrounded. Nebuchadnezzar's army is outside the city walls, and no one is allowed in or out. They're in control. And we know it's not going to end well, because God had already told Jeremiah that. In fact, that's why he's being confined. He had been prophesying and warning the people that Jerusalem was going to fall. And of course, the king did not want to hear that. But Jeremiah knew it was going to happen. And it seems hopeless, doubly hopeless, I bet, for poor Jeremiah. Do you remember that scene in the 1997 movie about Titanic, when Jack is arrested and chained to a metal pipe at the exact same time that the ship is going down? How could things possibly get any worse for him? And that's why I picture this biblical scene. Jeremiah is in a prison within a prison. Things are going from bad to worse, both for him and for God's people. Can you relate to that level of despair? I hope not, but maybe we can. We're not in a literal prison, though we are to remember those who are, but we may feel trapped by lots of other things, by our own anxiety, certainly, in these times. People in Ukraine and in other conflict zones around the world know what it is to be under siege. And all of us feel rattled and stressed by the latest round of nuclear threats that we earnestly pray is only rhetoric. Or think back to the very early days of 2020 when this new virus was making the headlines and we didn't know what was going to happen. And then bodies started to pile up in Italy and New York City and later India and we began to wonder what would our future be? Where is our hope? in these or any other uncertain times? Where is the hope when we feel trapped by our circumstances? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. It came in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah, and it came in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. It came despite a context of double, double imprisonment and impending doom. And what was that word from the Lord? Well, it doesn't actually sound very dramatic. God tells Jeremiah to buy a piece of land. His cousin is going to visit him 
and offer him first crack at the purchase, which is his right. As a side note, I kind of love that it's his cousin that comes to visit him. It reminds me of the story of Mary and Elizabeth, also cousins who were sent to each other to share good and hopeful news. The Bible seems to have a lot of cousins who change the world. And so Jeremiah's cousin comes to visit, and Jeremiah buys the plot of land, according to their customs. It sounds pretty humdrum for a word from God, doesn't it? Well, it might, until we remember that this real estate transaction is happening when Jerusalem is on the verge of collapse. Talk about a buyer's market. Why would Jeremiah purchase land that is about to be captured by another nation's king? Isn't that a bad bet? The worst bet imaginable? Well, maybe if Jeremiah was betting on the market, but he's not. Jeremiah is betting on God. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar was going to win the war. And yes, Israel would go into exile for a very long time. It was going to be devastating, and the pain was going to be real. But God was not done with them yet. They would return. And so suddenly this ordinary transaction, Jeremiah's sealed deed in a clay jar, becomes a symbol of unshakable hope. God's promises would come to pass. Israel would return. And daily life in their own home and with their own customs would resume. I wonder how deeply Jeremiah felt this truth. And I wonder how many of the people he prophesied to latched onto it. It's easy on the other side of some disaster to see that things got better. It's much harder to lay hold of hope at the beginning of a hard time. Because we don't know everything. We can't see the end. And we should not minimize the anxiety and bewilderment that comes with uncertain times, either theirs or ours. The message of today's reading from Jeremiah is not simply that it gets better. It's something more like that God never abandons us, even when danger has us surrounded and starts pounding on the door. And that whatever God deems worth preserving will be preserved. God created an everlasting covenant with Israel, and neither Nebuchadnezzar, nor Pharaoh before him, nor Herod, nor Caesar after him was going to destroy that. We don't always understand or even like God's timing or how these things are all worked out. Death comes before resurrection, and it hurts. But God is trustworthy, and God's word of hope has been given most fully and forever in Jesus Christ. And so the word of the Lord to us today may be to go ahead and invest in this broken world, to be kind to others even if it seems like there's no point, and to go ahead and keep planting seeds in and through what can feel like a broken and shrinking church. Investing your time and your resources in your faith and in all that God wants you to do, both through the church and in the world, is not a waste. God is trustworthy. We may not see all our plantings come to fruition, but someone will, and God will know. That's what the Gospel reading today is all about, right? That God always knows what we do in this world, and that what we do matters. And so do not lose heart as you think about those prisons of whatever it is that makes you feel trapped and do not lose heart when things look like all is going bad. Last week at our confirmation service, Archbishop Anne left us 100 tulip bulbs, there's about 35 of them, to plant around the church. I don't know if we have enough green space to do that on our grounds or not. We'll do as many as we can. But I want each of you to take one of these home with you today that you can plant wherever you like. Plant it in the faith that the promises of God will come to be. Plant it with a prayer and with a promise of your own to follow wherever it is that Christ leads, to invest in this world that God loves. 
This is what makes for a better future. And these are the seeds that give us hope. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Please stand, stand or sit or kneel, whichever you feel most comfortable doing. And the prayers for people for this morning can be found on page 110. Let me number one. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For peace on high and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the uh, Anglican cycle of prayer this morning, we pray for the Anglican Church of Burundi and for the the diocesan cycle, we pray for the people of All Saints White River and those in attendance today as their church building is being deconsecrated. We thank God for the witness and ministry of the parish through many generations. For our bishops and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For, for those in this town of Huntsville, and for every city and community, and for those who live in them, in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for good weather, and for abundant harvests for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have and for those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick, and the suffering for prisoners and captives and for their safety, health, and salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our deliverance from all afflictions, strife, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. For all those who have died, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Remembering all the saints, we commit ourselves to one another and our whole life to Christ our God. And uh, I would uh, ask that uh, you would turn to page number 129. And please join with me and we'll pray together the general thanksgiving prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for an immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies 
that was truly centralized, we may show forth your grace, not only with our lips, but in our minds, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites us to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. shelter of the Lord, who abide in his shadow for life. Say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock in whom I trust, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Snares of the fowler will never capture you, and famine will bring you no fear. Under his wings your refuge, his faithfulness your shield. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. You need not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though thousands fall about you, near you it shall not come. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you hand. For to his angels he's given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. 
He is your living word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you, and so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Oh, 
Almighty God, may we who have been strengthened by this Eucharist remain in your steadfast love and show in our lives the saving mystery that we celebrate. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.